Okay, after that whirlwind introduction to general relativity, we now uh, want to reformulate <clears throat> the theory in a way that turns out to be extremely useful for dealing with real life uh, situations like uh, binary systems involving compact objects, gravitational radiation, uh, even the solar system. So this formulation actually dates back to the 1940s when it was uh, put together in the famous book on general relativity by Landau and Lischitz. And it's based on first, the fundamental object of course that we want to derive is the metric, the space-time metric that we can use to, we can stick it into the equations of motion to find the motion of matter. Understanding that metric means understanding the space-time curvature and so on. So the metric is the ultimate goal. But this formulation actually is based on defining a new object related to the space-time metric. It's called the, we call it just called the Gothic metric density because you use a Gothic font to describe it. So it's equal to the metric of space-time. Here it's the inverse metric with the indices upstairs. You take that and multiply it by the determinant of the metric, square root. The minus sign here is just to make the determinant positive because for normal uh, space-time, uh, g is negative, so this makes it a, a real square root. So the square root of minus g times the upstairs or inverse metric, that defines this new object called the Gothic metric. So that's going to be the fundamental tool that we use to reformulate general relativity. But just remember, the real goal is to get the real physical metric, because that's, that's where the physics is. That tells you how b bodies move, how test particles move, how time evolves, and so on. Then, using this Gothic metric, we define this complicated object, H. It has all the same symmetries as the Riemann tensor, but it's not the Riemann tensor or anything close to it, but it, just, it does have the same symmetries. It's the product of this, the, these two metrics, alpha, beta, mu, nu, minus alpha, nu, beta, mu. And notice that this thing is anti-symmetric on the first two indices, right? If I switch alpha and mu, and alpha and mu, I get the negative of what I had, right? And it's anti-symmetric on the second two indices, the pair of indices, beta nu. So if I switch beta and nu here, and then switch beta and nu here, again, I get the negative of what I had before. And finally, it's, it's symmetric under interchange of these things pairwise. If I do that, you can see that uh, that stays the same, and that stays the same. So those happen to be the same symmetries as the Riemann tensor, uh, but that's just a, an observation. It's, this is really is just a, a product of two Gothic metrics with this minus sign. But it turns out that if you take the, yeah. Well, you're gonna, you're gonna see that it's not. Just, I mean, you can see that object there, uh, and that's, that'll be an important point. But, sorry? Does it have the symmetry that's associated with the reality? Well, I mean, it, again, it's just the same index symmetry as the Riemann tensor, and that's all. But it's quite a different object. It's not related to the Bianchi identity at all. But Landau and Lischitz, or I think they were the ones who discovered it, realized that if you take this object and take two partial derivatives, with respect to mu and nu, these two indices, you get a quantity that's equal to the Einstein tensor plus some other stuff. And now if you impose Einstein's equations, we know that the Einstein tensor is related to the stress energy tensor. And so they've showed that two derivatives of this object, given the Einstein equations, is, is equal to the stress energy tensor of matter 16 pi g over c to the fourth. There's minus g, this is the, again the determinant of the metric, plus stuff. This stuff is called the landau lifshitz pseudo tensor. And I'll show it on the next slide. I'll, I'll show the explicit formula. But just for now, this thing turns out to be quadratic in first derivatives of the Gothic metric. So schematically, it's quadratic in first derivatives. But this set of equations is mathematically equivalent to the Einstein equations, completely. 
No, I've made no approximations, I've done nothing. It's mathematically the same equation, reformulated. But as you pointed out, I've given something up because this equation is formulated using partial derivatives. So this is no longer a covariant equation. The Einstein equation was valid in any coordinate system. Here, at some point, I have to select a coordinate system because I'm making, I'm just doing partial derivatives. This is, this is a product of partial derivatives. Uh, and this landau lifshitz pseudo tensor involves partial derivatives. So I'm paying a price by, not ha by having something that's not generally covariant. On the other hand, in general relativity, even if you're working with the original Einstein equations, in order to do anything real, you've got to pick a coordinate system. Here we're picking a coordinate system already at the level of Einstein equations. But if you've done anything in general relativity, you know that if you want to find any solution, you've got to choose a coordinate system one day. You can't do everything in a completely abstract way. You've got to pick coordinates eventually. We're just doing it right off the bat. Okay, so we've not given up much by doing this. It's just that now we just have to remember we're no longer in the language of covariant of field equations. We've sort of uh, implicitly selected a coordinate system to do all of this work. But otherwise, this is the Einstein equations, but just written in a very strange form. Here's the land out. Oh, Why sorry. Do we need to do this oh, well. That's the whole point of this lecture, to really, and the next one, to, what you will discover is that this formulation is extremely useful for doing the kinds of approximations that we're gonna develop, okay? Much more useful than the original Einstein equations. And, we'll, and you, you will see this come out as we go along. It, that's really the, the main reason. It really allows you to systematically develop uh, approximations to Einstein's equations, uh, to solutions of Einstein's equations to higher and higher order. That's the real beauty of this whole thing. Yeah. Well, no, no coordinate system is physically relevant, right? All coordinates are completely arbitrary. Right, but. If there's some interpretation that I can assign. In a, in, a, in a moment, we're going to really specify a, a, cord, a specific coordinate system. Here, it's still pretty general. I haven't said what this coordinate system is going to be, only that you have to work in some coordinate system because these are coordinate derivatives, partial derivatives. Uh, two slides from now, we're going to actually specify a specific coordinate system or class of coordinate systems that further simplifies this whole thing. These are called harmonic coordinates, and they will be very important. But at the end of the day, we know coordinates have no physical relevance. So once you have a solution, once you have your metric, you can transform that metric to any coordinate system you like and, and, and go to town. So, uh, you know, but, but to, to make it, to apply this formulation, we're gonna have to pick a specific coordinate system. Yeah, so she's asking if you transform the coordinate frame, if I were to make a coordinate transformation, these equations would all change, would, would look very different. If I would go from this one that I've selected, I haven't really specified it, but if I were to make a transformation, this thing could change dramatically. But again, uh, as I said, in any real app problem in GR, we always like to think that it's covariant and that's wonderful and that's very beautiful, but to do real calculations for, for practical calculations, you ultimately have to ch pick a coordinate system. And so we've just picked one here before, almost from the get-go. Usually you pick it somewhat later, but, but here we're doing it right away. So I know people sometimes are troubled by that. Well, it's not generally covariant, but exactly so. We don't want it to be generally covariant because this thing is gonna be so useful that uh, we're gonna give up general covariance. I mean, we're just gonna always work in some coordinate system to, to solve these equations. Other questions? Okay, here's the landau lifshitz pseudo tensor. Oh, of, of a very important point that I forgot to mention. Because this thing is anti-symmetric on the last uh, two indices, if I then take, look at this guy and take another partial derivative, 
with respect to beta, what do I get? Zero, because this is anti-symmetric on beta and nu, and if I have a partial with respect to beta, we know partial derivatives commute, so it, that, that would be symmetric on beta and nu, and so you get zero. So that means that the partial derivative of this with respect to beta must vanish, and again, it's a, or it's a partial derivative, so that must vanish. And you can show, then, it, it, that if you assume these equations, Einstein's equations, combined with that, you can show that this equation is mathematically equivalent to our original covariant equation giving the equations a motion of matter. And that's something you can prove rigorously. You have to assume Einstein's equations to do it. This is general in all cases from the covariant point of view. This is always true, whether Einstein's equations are satisfied or not. But here, if you take this, combined with Einstein's equations, you can show that that is equivalent to that. And then what we're going to do is, when we talk about the equations of motion, we're going, you have a choice. Once you've found the metric by solving these equations, you can use that to get your equations of motion, or you can use that either way. Sometimes one, case, one version is simpler than the other. This tends to be the simpler version, but you can use either one. They're, they're again, formally equivalent to each other. And these conservation equations, then, we'll, we'll use those, too, to talk about global properties of uh, isolated systems. And this formulation will play a crucial role in gravitational waves, too. Okay, there's the landau lifshitz pseudotensor. That's this thing that sits on the right-hand side. And there it is. It looks horrible, but you know you, you, you soon learn to love and grow it. You grow, you, you soon to, you, if you embrace it, you soon uh, learn to love it. Notice it's quadratic in partial derivatives of these Gothic metrics. There's some other metrics here just to contract the indices, but it's always quadratic, no higher order terms, just quadratic in derivatives. Okay. That'll turn out to be a very useful and important property uh, of this object. Now, if you look at this equation, it's, it sort of says something like, uh, here's uh, two, maybe, maybe I'll say it better, uh, oh, yeah, let's just move on. So those conservation equations allow us to, uh, um, in a very nice way, uh, deal with the conservation of energy and, and other uh, global variables, and also to understand how those things might change with time. The point is, if I take this equation, if I look at this, this says d by dt, of the zero component, where beta is zero, plus the divergence, the ordinary coordinate divergence of this thing with spatial indices, del j dot this thing with some j's, must vanish. So suppose I define an energy to be minus g times t zero zero, the zero component of that object, plus the zero zero component of the landau lifshitz pseudotensor. Then this thing, has a rate of change that can be written as a surface integral. And let's just see how that works. So dE dt is equal to the integral of the partial with respect to t of minus g t0,0 plus t0,0 lambda Lifshitz integrated over all space, right? The d by dt becomes a partial inside because we have to hold x fixed. Uh, but because of that divergence equation, d by dt of that is equal to minus d by dxj of minus g. of minus g t zero j plus t lando Lichitz zero j d3x, right? Because remember, it was a partial derivative. 
partial beta of t zero beta is equal to zero. If I split that up into a time derivative and a spatial derivative, then this is equal to minus that, right? But this is a partial a divergence, an ordinary coordinate divergence of an object integrated over all space, so this can be turned into a surface integral. And the surface, in, surface will be, say, very, very far away from the system, maybe at infinity. Well, at infinity, we presume there's no T0j. That's the matter. So as long as our system isn't blasting out some big wind of particles, we can set that equal to zero. But this won't necessarily be zero because this is made up of the metric itself. It's got those grad of the Gothic metric. It may be getting smaller at infinity, but it's not going to be purely zero. So there may be some of this at infinity, depending on what the source is doing. So dE by dt, then, is equal to a surface integral of that thing over this surface very, very far away. And what we'll discover as we go along is that this landau lifshitz pseudo tensor contains the gravitational waves in a radiating system. And so this tells you that the energy of a system will change if it's radiating gravitational radiation. And you can calculate that change by determining that pseudo tensor and doing that surface integral. In fact, we'll do it as we uh, later on. So it's a different kind of a conservation law. In Newtonian theory, energy was strictly conserved because there was no gravitational radiation. Here, energy is not strictly conserved, but there is a kind of conservation law. The system loses energy because energy is flowing to infinity via gravitational waves. Okay, so there's still a balance of energy. We, something loses, but something gains at infinity because there's this energy flowing away. And it's contained in this landau lifshitz pseudo tensor. Okay, and the, way, the reason we can do that, find a surface, convert this time derivative into a surface integral, is because the conservation law here involves partial derivatives. And that's really why we like this formulation with partial derivatives. It allows us to define these kinds of conservation laws. So we've give, again, we've given up covariance, but we've gained by having a very nice way to, to express these conservation laws. And you can write down similar uh, laws for the momentum of the system. The, the jth component of this object can be used to define the total momentum of the system. And its rate of change will depend on the amount of momentum being radiated away. Uh, the angular momentum of the system can be defined in the obvious way. So this is like the momentum density. This is x. And this is the, uh, the you know, Levi-Civita symbol that really turns this, this into an x cross p. And that's what angular momentum is. So you can define the total angular momentum, and you can find the rate of change of total angular momentum as, as you know, the amount of it being radiated. I'm sorry? So this, this E, for example, turns out, and you can show, it is the total energy, mass energy of the system. For example, if you look at the, if you have a, a system that's stationary, and you look at the metric very far away, and you know that the metric very far away, G00, is minus one plus G times the mass of the system over R, Two. Then for such systems, this energy, and if you divide by c squared, you get a mass, turns out to be exactly that. So you can identify these things physically as the mass for the system you would measure if you're at infinity. And you know in general relativity, you measure the mass of a system by putting a satellite in orbit around it and use Kepler's laws to determine the mass that it would take to produce the orbital period that you measure for that satellite going around far away. It's called the Kepler measured mass. It turns out that this really is that mass. And similarly, these, this really is the momentum of the system that you would measure by making various measurements. This is the angular momentum you, of the system you would measure by studying the behavior of gyroscopes very far away, etc. So. And it's a, it's a complicated story to actually show, prove these things, but you can, you can work it out. Yeah. 
So it, it, this. Thank you, John. Well, again, so if you if you threw this away, you would get something that just has no meaning. I mean, you, you could calculate it, but it would not be related to anything measurable. It's only the combination of these two that gives you the total mass of the system. So this really is crucial in this formulation to getting out things that are physically meaningful. Now you might say, well, why can't you just integrate this? This looks like density integrated over all space. That should be the mass. Turns out it isn't. It's only this combination that gives you the actual total mass of the system that you measure by making observations far away. Okay. And you can also define a center of mass of the system uh, in a way very analogous to what we did in Newtonian theory, but now you have to use this full uh, T plus the landau lifshitz T to get the, an answer that really produces some meaningful uh, qu quantity that uh, is physical. But now I want to uh, make this problem even simpler and, and produce something that we can actually uh, use and work with. <clears throat> and there's a, a couple of steps to this. First, we have this Gothic metric. And what we expect in most situations, there are there are situations that, where it won't work, but in most situations, we expect that the physical metric that we want to derive is going to be fairly close to the flat space-time metric of Minkowski. That the deviations produced by gravity are going to be weak. They'll deviate by some uh, small amount where this is small compared to the ones that appear in the Minkowski metric in some suitable way. So this, again, we're going to assume that we're in relatively weak field situations. Okay, and that applies, that, that's gonna work for many, many important cases that we want to study. Okay, so the idea is that we will assume that there's some, we can define some sort of background uh, flat space-time metric that's sort of always there. And we have our Gothic metric that's related to the full physical metric. And from these two objects, we're going to define this thing, H. It's called the field. We'll call, we'll, we'll call it the gravitational field. Okay, just, a, just a name. But it's really, just, it's really only the difference between the flat metric and the Gothic metric. And again, we expect this to be fairly close to that so that H will be some small quantity in a suitable sense. Okay. Then using that H, we're going to impose a, a, a coordinate condition. The coordinate condition says that the divergence of this quantity H, so take a partial derivative and then contract on beta, that that divergence vanishes. Now in some ways this ought to look a little bit familiar because in electrodynamics, you often, uh, you can formulate the uh, Maxwell's equations, but again, to make some progress, you often impose a gauge condition that looks like the, di the divergence of the vector potential vanishes, right? That's called Lorentz gauge in electrodynamics, and you often impose that gauge uh, because it simplifies certain calculations, and you can, and you can work these out. So this looks a little bit like that. It's, a, it's of course, H is a tensor, not a vector, but you're, it's the same kind of thing. You take a divergence on one of, the ind, of one of the indices and you get zero. In fact, this is sometimes called Lorentz gauge. A better term is harmonic gauge or sometimes called the Donder gauge. Um, but it really is a, it's a choice of coordinates. Why is it a choice of coordinates? Because A, this is a partial derivative and not a covariant derivative. So that already says you're, you're, you're choosing coordinates. And it really is a constraint on this metric. It says in a certain coordinate system, these harmonic coordinates, the partial derivative of this must vanish. 
if I picked another coordinate system, I'm, it wouldn't vanish because we know if choosing, changing coordinates will change this partial derivative into something much more messy and the thing won't vanish anymore. So the fact that this condition involves a partial derivative is, tells you that you're selecting coordinates. In fact, you can show uh, that this condition is equivalent to the following statement. If I were to take each of these coordinates that I say that I've chosen, these harmonic coordinates, take each one, and imagine each one as being a scalar field on space-time. So there'll be a time coordinate and three spatial coordinates. But let's assume for the moment each one is a scalar field. I treat it as a scalar field. Then it turns out that that condition on H is equivalent to saying that the d'Alembertian with respect to the curved space-time, and this is the scalar field d'Alembertian, of each of these coordinates, each one in turn, one, two, three, four, is zero. And let me just remind you what this d'Alembertian is for a scalar field. It's one over the square root of minus g, partial with respect to alpha, times the square root of minus g, times the field that you're looking at. Um, g alpha beta, partial with respect to beta, of the scalar field. So that's the, that's the d'Alembertian of a scalar field. Okay. So if you take each of these four coordinates, imagine for the moment it's a scalar field, one by one, impose that equation on it, that's equivalent to that statement. Okay. And it's pretty easy to show if you, if you remember that this is equal to that. Eta is just the constants, minus 1, 1, 1, 1. So the derivatives don't act on eta. So it's grad beta of, of this Gothic metric. And if you plug in the form of the Gothic metric, uh, you can easily convince yourselves that you end up with this, this equation for each of the four coordinates. So that really tells you that each coordinate you pick has to satisfy this very strong condition. In fact, uh, that's why these coordinates are called harmonic. Uh, a harmonic function is in any manifold is one that satisfies the uh, homogeneous uh, d'Alembertian of that, of that manifold. So the name harmonic is, is attached to this because such a function in any uh, manifold is, is known as a harmonic function. Okay, so this really is a choice of coordinates. We've constrained our coordinates, each coordinate, each of the four, to satisfy this equation. So we've selected coordinates. So again, we've given up general covariance, we've chosen coordinates. But when you do that, a, a miracle occurs. And the earlier expression, that involved all these double derivatives of this horrible thing. Here we plug in for g, the Gothic g to be eta plus h, and so on. Um, and then when you carry out all these derivatives, and when you impose this coordinate condition, you discover that that earlier equation reduces to this very nice equation. You find that it's the d'Alembertian of h alpha beta, and here it's the flat space-time d'Alembertian, the ordinary flat space-time, d by dt squared plus del squared. The flat space-time d'Alembertian of h is equal to 16 pi g over c to the fourth times this quantity on the right-hand side, which has our earlier stress-energy tensor and the landau lichitz pseudo-tensor. That was just already on the right-hand side of that earlier equation, plus one new term called the harmonic uh, pseudo-tensor it just comes from some derivatives that, that, were, that showed up on the left-hand side of the equation that we move over to the right-hand side. And there's the explicit formula for it. It's just a few, some extra derivatives, one double derivative of the H's that, that remains. Okay. Once again, we have the same kind of order, uh, conservation expression, this divergence of the right-hand side must vanish because the divergence of the left-hand side must vanish. 
earlier it vanished because of the identity on, uh, on the capital H, but here it vanishes just because we've chosen uh, harmonic coordinates. If you take the divergence of the left-hand side with respect to beta, you just get the down version of that, but it's already zero. So that means the divergence of the right-hand side must vanish. And here again are the equations of motion that you can use, and you also can use this expression for to establish those conservation uh, statements that I showed earlier. But again, this is still mathematically equivalent to Einstein's equations. We've made no approximations. This is still the exact Einstein's equations. But we've expressed it in a, first in a form where we've selected a coordinate system. But what is really is beautiful about this approach is that this is the flat space-time wave operator. And we know how to find solutions of, of those equations, right? Just as in when we had uh, the Laplace equation, we could find solutions because we knew the Green's function for the, for the Laplacian. We know the Green's function for the D'Alembertian in flat space time. We'll, we'll write it down in a few slides. And so it allows us to really formulate solutions of this set of equations using mathematical machinery that is so familiar from electrodynamics and all other kinds of other fields of physics where you have this simple wave operator. Uh, there's tons of mathematics that shows you how to find solutions of these kinds of equations. So this, this is one reason why this approach turns out to be very useful. Any, any comments? Yep. A minus sign where? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Should be a minus sign, sorry. I'm, I'm actually correcting these as we go along, and I'm replacing the versions on the web with the corrected versions. There was a minus sign in the earlier lecture. I fixed that, and I'll upload it, and I'll, I'll correct that one, too. OK. Any other questions about this, uh, this formulation? If you've not seen it before, I know it seems very strange compared to the standard way of thinking about general relativity. but. It turns out to be very powerful. Well, this part is where it sort of embodies Wheeler's uh, statement that matter tells space-time how to curve. Here's the matter, right? And it's telling space-time how to curve. And then this equation, once you've got h, you plug it into here, and this tells matter how to move. Okay? So there, you've kind of split the problem up into two. And I call these the relaxed Einstein equations because you really only get a solution, a space-time solution of Einstein's equations when you have solved both of these problems, right? Simultaneously or self-consistently because that gives you what the space-time looks like as a function of space and time, what the, gives you the full metric at all times and at all parts of space. But because we've formulated this in terms of a flat, flat space-time wave equation, and because we know the Green's function, we can formally solve this equation using the Green's function for the D'Alembertian as functionals of the matter variables. Remember this thing, T alpha beta, depends on the matter variables, symbolized by this M for matter. So we can formally express H as a functional of these matter variables. That's not a solution yet, because we don't know what the matter variables are doing, but formally we can write it in terms of those matter variables formally. Then we can, and so that's relaxed. We don't know what the matter variables are, but we can develop these solutions formally uh, in great depth and to very high orders, and you can really go to develop very uh, sophisticated solutions. You don't yet know what the matter is doing, but then this part, once you've solved that, take these formal H's and plug them in, solve that, that tells you what the matter is doing, and then you've got the answer for the full space time. So you can make this into a kind of two-step process. You can formally start to find these solutions, leaving, relaxing the motion of the matter, and then at the end of the day, fix the motion of the matter, and then you've got your answer. 
And what we'll do is, is work on this iteratively. In a weak field approximation, we can sort of do this by an iteration technique that I'll describe in a second. And I've just said that, OK? So all of this formally is a functional of the matter variables. And then use this equation to, where, of course, h appears in here everywhere. Uh, solve that for the evolution of the matter variables. Finally, that will give you h as a function of space-time. And from h, you can construct the physical metric uh, via that Gothic metric. But here's where we now introduce our assumption that we're primarily working with weak gravitational fields, situations where h is small compared to unity. Okay. So we're not going to be able to do physics you know, at the event horizon of a black hole, because there the, the, the difference between the, the deviations from, the met, from flat space time are of order unity. It's very strongly curved. So there are certain things we have to give up with this approach. We can't talk about event horizons. But we can certainly talk about two black holes orbiting each other. If we just sort of cut out the region where the black holes are and treat them as sort of some sort of masses, between the black holes, gravity could be pretty weak. If the, their speeds are you know, a tenth of the speed of light, then the deviation from flat space time is only a part in 100. And so you know, to 1% accuracy, we can, we can analyze what goes on with those two orbiting black holes as long as we stay away from the event horizon. And the beauty of this technique is that we can iterate to higher and higher orders so that even if the deviation is one part in 100, we can go to the second order, so now we're accurate to one part in 10,000. We can actually go to the third order, so we're accurate to one part in uh, a million, and so on. You can get higher and higher order corrections to get very increasingly accurate solutions that can actually take you up to very relativistic regimes uh, for some of these systems. Well, how does one do that? Well, you notice that uh, the right-hand side the ta here that contained the landau lichitz pseudotensor, um, it contained H itself. So this is a bit awkward. We have a, a wave equation uh, for H with a right-hand side that involves H itself. But H is small, and the right-hand side, all the contributions of H, there are some inside the matter stress energy tensor, but the landau lichitz piece and that uh, harmonic piece were all quadratic in H, at least. So if h is small, the terms on the right-hand side are even smaller. So that suggests that we can iterate. We can take some zeroth order solution for h and plug it in on the right-hand side. That, of course, would be zero, just no h whatsoever. Then integrate this and solve. Here's the, here's the formal integral. I've actually inserted the Green's function. So we can find h as an integral over this right-hand side. But now the integral is not just the you know, Newtonian integral, 1 over x minus x prime integrated over all space. But the time part has to be retarded. Remember, this is a wave equation, and the solutions involve retarded Green's functions. And so the time, if you want to evaluate h at a certain time t, you have to integrate over the source at an earlier, integrate it over its behavior at an earlier time, t minus the distance between the integration point, source point, and your field point. Okay. This just reflects the finite speed of propagation of any interaction, including gravity. What happens here now depends on what happened there then. Okay. So uh, instead of the instantaneous Green's function of Newtonian theory, you have a retarded Green's function. So h is given by an integral of this ta with this retar retardation over x, uh, integrated over all space. But as I said, if h is small, on the right-hand side, the contributions here are quadratic in h, so their contributions are even smaller. So let's pick, for a zeroth approximation, put zero in here. Wherever you see an h, put just stick zero, and then do this integral to get the first approximation. Then take that first approximation. It'll be a formal solution, of course. Plug that back in and get a second approximation. Take that second one, plug it back in, get a third approximation, and just keep going until you, know, you, you have the accuracy you, you need or until you're uh, dead or sick of doing this over and over and over again. Yeah? Uh, 
I'm sorry, you have to shout. It's something that we raised before. Why do you think it's taking Why, why? Oh, um, so formally, the Green's function is integral over d4x, but there's a delta function that converts the t prime into this. Right? So, and that, that comes from the Green's function. So I, I've done one extra step to, to convert the dt prime. It's a dt prime in a delta function that produces the retardation. So all that's left is a d3x. Okay, so you start with a zero th approximation, that's zero, and then you just keep going and going and going, and then truncate when you're at a level of n that you think you need to solve a certain problem. And as you can see, each time you solve for h, you get a power of g, right? So if you, the first approximation, when you throw, when you put zero here, h1 will be proportional to g. When you plug that in there and do it again, then this thing's gonna be proportional to g squared and so on. So what you end up with is an expansion for, for the, your field in powers of g, and this is what's called a post-Minkowskian expansion. The zeroth order, you just get Minkowski space, h is zero, and the metric is uh, the Minkowski metric. Then at first order, first order in g, you get a first deviation from the Minkowski, and then going to higher orders, you get higher order ones. So this is a, called a post-Minkowski expansion. And once you've got the field at the level of iteration that you need, your desired n, then you take that n and you can plug it into the, this tau alpha beta and use the ordinary divergence of that to vanish. That will give you your equations of motion. And once you have the equations of motion, that information then allows you to get the full metric. Um, Generally speaking, of course, what we are really interested in are the equations of motion, but depending on the situation, you may need to get the metric as well to that order of approximation. Okay? Okay, so let's think a little bit about what this integral means. This is a retarded integral. So if we're sitting at some uh, point x at some time t, this says that we're integrating over this source over x prime, but over values of t that as you increase, as you change x prime in your integral, this, uh, this is going to change with time. The different times that where you evaluate your source are going to change for the different x primes. And when you do that, you get something that looks like this. So here we're at a field point x where we want to evaluate our field. And the source sits all over the place. It's, there's some of it associated with the matter, some associated with the gravitational field itself. And as you change x prime, say starting from x itself and continuing to integrate that x minus x prime grows, but that means t must decrease. So in fact, you are integrating along this past null cone of the source point. So geometrically, that's what that integral is doing. You want the field here, then you have to evaluate the source along this past null cone and do the integration over all x prime, but as x prime gets bigger, you know, as this grows and grows, uh, you're also going back in time all the way to the infinite past. So as your integral goes to infinity in space, you're also going back into the infinite past. So you need to know the source everywhere along this past null cone of your field point in order to uh, find the solution. And here, uh, I want to kind of get into this a little more by just considering a simpler problem. Let's get rid of all the indices and all the land delicious stuff and uh, just simplify our problem into a, a d'Alembertian of a field psi given by some source mu. So the integral version is that psi is the integral over this past null cone, mu evaluated at retarded time, divided by one over x minus x prime, d3 x prime. Okay, just so I've thrown away all the indices, the t's and the land delicious, just a very simple problem, because I really want to illustrate how this integral has to proceed over the past null cone. 
And one important step that you take, have to take here, and you do this the same thing in electrodynamics, for example, is to divide your spatial region into two regimes. A so-called near zone, so the source is going to, we're going to assume lies somewhere in here. This is where our matter resides. This is a space-time diagram, by the way, so time is flowing upwards. So our source, maybe our two stars orbiting each other, are in some world line here, a world tube along here. Then relative to the, where the actual physical material source is, you define a region with a radius that is, or a region within uh, one gravitational wavelength of the source. In other words, R is roughly speaking the wavelength of the radiation that might be emitted. It's roughly speaking the scale of the source divided by the typical velocity of the source. Okay. So this is roughly speaking, the size of the source over a characteristic of velocity is like the period, the dynamical period of the source, and that period is related to the frequency, or one over the frequency of radiation, and one over the frequency is related to the wavelength. And in electrodynamics, you, that's called the near zone. We use the same terminology here. And then there's the wave zone, which is the region outside this uh, region where R prime is greater than R. So this uh, world tube here is the near zone world tube, okay? Distances from the source within one gravitational wavelength, but of course it moves forward in time. So this is the near zone, and then everything here is the wave zone. Okay? You, and you do this because the nature of the fields in the two zones is quite different. Within the near zone, and this is true in electrodynamics, the fields tend to be instantaneous because the effect of the retardation doesn't kick in until you're about one wavelength away. So you can think of the fields as being almost instantaneous responses to the behavior of the source because you're just so close. It's only in the wave zone where you start to get the fact that the waves are retarded and you get real waves. And so the mathematics of the two zones can be very different. You do this in E and M, and so you, you treat the two zones mathematically very differently. And then at the end of the day, you have to sum up the uh, solutions that you get in the two zones. The thing of it is, in electrodynamics, you only worry about the near zone. Even if your field point, you want to find out wh what the field is doing out here, you only integrate over the near zone. In fact, you really only integrate over the source. Why? Because electrodynamics is a linear theory. The source of the electromagnetic field is just the charge distribution. So the source is confined to this very narrow world tube where the charges actually are. So the only thing that contributes to your solution in E and M is the stuff within here. So you just integrate over this. In fact, you just integrate over the charges and you're done. And you've got your answer for the electromagnetic waves. Right? But as we saw with this landau lifshitz formulation, now our source on the right-hand side has the field itself. The matter part, the stars, are, that's confined into this source region, this world tube here. But the landau lifshitz and that harmonic stuff exists everywhere in space-time. So you have to include it in your integral. You can't ignore it. Why? Because general relativity is a nonlinear theory. Gravity itself generates gravity. And so the source here exists not just where the matter is, it exists throughout the near zone and it exists throughout the far zone. Now, to be fair, you expect the, the contributions of the, say, the landau lifshitz pseudotensor, the gravitational terms, to get smaller and smaller the further you are away from the source. On the other hand, they're getting smaller and smaller, but you're integrating over a region that's getting bigger and bigger. So it's not obvious that those terms will, uh, will vanish, or they might, it's not obvious how, how much they will contribute. And in fact, we'll see that they really do contribute in important ways. So in gravity, then, we have to uh, really take into account two separate kinds of integrations. First, there's this integrate. We want the field here. We have to integrate, do this integral over the near zone. So that's this little patch where this world tube intersects the past null cone, right? So we'll call that n. So we have the integral over n. 
And then we have the integral over everything else. This is w, psi of w. And then we have to add the two together to get the full solution to the field. This is really crucial in gravity because the source exists not just here, the source exists everywhere through those nonlinear terms coming from the lando pseudo pseudotensor and the harmonic pseudotensor. Okay, so let's see how you would do that and how you would uh, develop some machinery to show how you, could, how you can kind of uh, work out this problem and get, uh, make some real progress. So let's first look at the near zone integral, this, just this part, psi n. So we're looking at field points outside in the, in the wave zone, but we need to integrate the source over this near zone. It's a very complicated region to integrate over, right? It's this surface of this null cone. It's kind of curved, and then it has this boundary. So how do you do that kind of an integral? What you do know, however, is that um, if you, you measure x, the position of a field point from the center of mass of your source, which is, say, along here, along the center of this tube, if x is the distance from here to here, then x prime, which is where everything is within the near zone, you're only integrating over the near zone, x prime is going to be small compared to x. Right? x prime is going to be less than one gravitational wavelength, but you're out here where LIGO sits, billions of gravitational wavelengths away, so x prime is going to be small compared to x. So it makes sense to do a Taylor expansion about x, about x with x prime being small. Again, this just applies to this part of the integral. So remember our source looks like this retarded uh, source and 1 over x minus x prime. Well, as just before, we can do a Taylor expansion, minus 1 to the L over L factorial, L, uh, a product of L uh, x components, L derivatives of the same thing, but evaluated where x prime is zero. Okay? Simple Taylor expansion. So we have the derivative of this thing. Remember in Newtonian theory, of course, we didn't have that. We just had the derivatives of 1 over r. So now it's a bit more complicated. The, the, these gradients can also act on the r that sits within the uh, retardation. That just complicates things slightly, but if you think back to Newtonian theory, we didn't have this term, and it was just grad L of 1 over R. That would have given our expansion. So it's a bit more subtle, but still it shouldn't be so hard to do. Um, that then tells us that our field, the, the, part, the part of our field coming from this near zone integral, is the sum over L minus 1 over L factorial, partials of L, and here we can integrate um, this. Yeah, so this is the source. This is the source evaluated at tau. Here now, just to make life simple, I'm defining tau to be uh, t minus r over c. Uh, r is just the full distance from the center of mass to our field point. So I've replaced this by tau. But remember, it does depend on r. That should be a little r, actually. Um, so there's our source integrated over x prime. Here are the L components of x integrated over d3x. And then we have this derivative of 1 over r times that that we have to calculate. Okay, Looks just like our expansion of the Newtonian potential. The same thing, derivatives. These look like multiple moments because we didn't have any retardation uh, to worry about. Okay. What we've done, is essentially, is to convert this integral over this very strange shape that, that varies in time, right? This is a later time than that. It's a very st strange uh, domain in space-time to integrate over. By doing this expansion, notice we're integrating at a fixed retarded time. It's just this time minus that distance over C. So it's actually a fixed retarded time. So we're really integrating over this domain. And we get from this to this by doing a Taylor expansion, expanding about this domain. The true field is on here, but we're expanding it as a Taylor series on that domain. 
Well, that's nice because we can, the, the, the retarded time is fixed, so we don't have to worry about that. On the other hand, notice that this integral is just over this domain. It's not an integral over all space, just over this region. So in general, the integrals may depend on the radius of this domain, the, how you've chosen as your boundary between the near zone and the far zone. Well, what about the other part of the integral? The integral over the rest of the null cone. We have to carry out that integral. And that gets to be a bit of a mess because basically we're integrating over this past null cone. And there's no simple uh, or obvious way to do that. But if you realize that in the far zone, all the contributions to this source come from the fields themselves. There's no matter out here anymore. The matter was confined deep within the near zone. So it's only that landau lifshitz stuff that contributes in the far zone. And that thing is made up of fields that themselves are retarded fields. Because remember, we've taken our solutions and stuck them back in, and, it's, and they're already retarded because we've solved them by the retarded Green's functions. So these, all the contributions to mu in this far zone are made up of retarded functions plus functions of theta and phi, the angles, and they all, uh, as it's easy to show, fall off with various powers of this distance to the nth power. You know, they're all fields that fall off with r, and so you get generic fall off. So there's retardation plus power law fall off in r. Well, that fact then allows you to uh, change variables. Instead of integrating over d3x, or, you know, dr prime, d theta prime, sine theta prime, d phi prime, if you did spherical coordinates, instead of integrating over that kind of three coordinates, change to a new variable, u, where one of them is u prime, namely t prime minus r prime. It's a kind of retarded uh, radial coordinate, leaving theta and phi the same. Use this fact that you, that you can show. And uh, it turns out that that making this kind of coordinate change is equivalent to saying what I'm going to do is integrate over this two-dimensional hypersurface. So if I pick a fixed value of u prime, then I integrate over this uh, two-dimensional surface, the angular integrals. So that's this two-dimensional hypersurface. It looks like a line, but I've suppressed one of the angles. And it turns out that that is the intersection between the light cone we're looking at and a future directed null cone originating from the origin of our system where the sources are. And it's that intersection line, it's a two dimensional hypersurface. That's what we're integrating over when we vary theta and phi holding u prime fixed. Okay? And then you integrate that when you now you have to integrate over all values of u prime. And that corresponds to considering a whole sequence of future directed null cones, uh, starting from way in the past, moving toward the future, and then up all the way up to where this future cone is just tangent to our past null cone. So here, uh, and this thing, of course, starts way down at minus infinity, this cone, moves steadily upwards as you, as you change your u prime, each value of u prime, you're looking at a new cone, integrating over all the angles, means you're integrating along this, over this two-dimensional uh, surface. Uh, here's some explicit formulas, which I won't, uh, whose details I won't bore you with. Um, at some point, of course, this intersection bumps up against the near zone. And so we have to cut off this integration over angles once you hit this near zone, because we've already done the integral there. And then finally, uh, the last null cone just involves integrating over this, this line up to our field point, again, starting from the edge of the near zone up to our line. And then, as I said, formally, this is, this is how you do the integrals, integral over all uh, angles, theta and phi, and then an integral over this u prime from minus infinity, start at the infinite past, all the way up to the current retarded time, u, u being t minus r over c. And as you can see, this outer integral, in principle, depends also on the radius of the boundary between the near zone and the far zone. So it turns out, well, 
Clearly, when you add the two together, you should get an answer that's independent of that boundary. You've chosen it arbitrarily. You might have chosen it to be one gravitational wavelength, but maybe you could choose it to be two gravitational wavelengths. The answer clearly cannot depend on that arbitrary choice of the boundary between the two zones. And it turns out you can actually show in this, uh, this post-Minkowski uh, approximation, you can show that the explicit terms that you get from this integral that depend on R are exactly canceled term by term, order by order, with the explicit terms that you get from here that depend on R. So not only does it have to be independent, you can show explicitly that it is independent of that, uh, that choice. Um, I mean, there are a lot of details here that I don't necessarily uh, expect you to, to worry about, but, um, uh, but just to emphasize the point that when you want to solve for these fields, you do have to integrate not, just, not only over the near zone, but also over the far zone, because there you can get important contributions to the field. And I want to get, illustrate one example of those contributions with this little picture. Here's our source, confined to some narrow world tube. There's our near zone. There's the, the world tube of the near zone, our field point. This is the full null cone, and this is the far zone, everything but the near zone. So you can have a situation. So you get a contribution from uh, the near zone that tells you what the, the field is there from that part. But then there's this contribution from the wave zone, which appears to have involved the past history of the source. And you can really see that explicitly. This is the stuff directly from the near, near zone to us. It, hurt, it occurred at a time t minus r earlier. But from a time even earlier, here you could, this system could emit some gravitational waves that out here could scatter off the space-time curvature that exists there because of the source itself and reach you. So at this time, you are getting waves, you're getting a signal from the behavior of the source earlier than your normal retarded time. And you evaluate that source. There's a contribution there that comes from that integral over the exterior part of the light cone. Even earlier, you might get a signal that bounces here. Now, this, these contributions will get weaker and weaker as you go further and further into the past because this has to go all the way out here to bounce. It's getting weaker as it travels. Space-time curvature is getting weaker. So this becomes a weaker signal. And, and what that really tells you is that these integrals that you have to do over this zone tend to converge as you integrate into the infinite past. So there are no divergences in these problems. Everything diverges, converges very nicely, simply because everything gets weaker when you go further into the past. Your, two, your binary star system in the infinite past was much further away than it is uh, at this retarded time. You know, gravitational waves slowly causes the two things to get closer and closer together, but if you turn the clock backwards, the further away you go, the uh, further apart they were, the slower they were moving, the weaker everything was. So even though you have to formally do these integrals, over all space-time, uh, they really do converge uh, rapidly as you go into the past. You get nice finite results you know, for every uh, calculation. Okay, But again, I'm just emphasizing that because gravity generates gravity, because the right-hand side does not have what's called compact support, it really exists everywhere in space-time, uh, you do have to take it into account. Well, that's one thing. That's for finding the field in the far zone where a gravitational wave detector might live. But we would also like to, for example, find the equations of motion of the source itself. So we also need to know the, what the field looks like here, say, near each body, so that we can learn how the bodies move, right? So we also need to do a calculation of the fields within the near zone. so that we can stick them into our equations of motion and determine how our source behaves. Well, here the expansion, we can do a similar kind of expansion, but it's a little bit different. Here, x and x prime, our field point and the integration point, are within 
the near zone itself. And so you can think of them as being, so this is sort of small in a certain sense, relative to time. So here we can do an expansion not about x prime, but do an expansion in powers of x minus x prime over c. Again, just as in electrodynamics, you can approximate the behavior as being more or less instantaneous at the time t, but you include these higher order expansions. So in this case, the true cone that you have to integrate over is the sort of the peak of this cone, that's the n, but we're going to approximate that by doing a Taylor expansion about this surface, which is at fixed t, the same time as where you're evaluating the field. But it's just a Taylor series, so you can see how this works. The source is equal to that, and if we do a Taylor expansion about this, minus one over L, L factorial, there will be a C to the L coming from there. L time derivatives, because we only, only have to expand the, the time part. Time, L time derivatives of the source evaluated at this instantaneous time times that x minus x prime to the lth power. So it's a very simple Taylor expansion. Plug that into the solution, then psi, the, the near zone part of our field then is all of this stuff times L time derivatives of a kind of potential with our source mu times x minus x to the L minus one. At the lowest order, L equals zero, what do we get? Our field, that's one, that's one, that's one, that's one, no time derivatives, and it's just mu over x minus x prime. So the lowest order contribution is just like the Newtonian potential. But then there are higher order contributions that you need to take into account because Newtonian theory says that this is exact, everything is instantaneous. In a relativistic theory, everything is not instantaneous. So you take those corrections into account via that Taylor expansion. Notice that it's a, now it's an expansion in powers of one over C, and this is where we get this idea of a post-Newtonian expansion. Uh, time derivatives imply velocities, and if velocities are small compared to C, this looks like an expansion in powers of V over C. And as long as that, that V over C is small, then uh, we get what we call a post-Newtonian expansion. All the potentials are instantaneous. We no longer have retardation since we're in the near zone. But once again, even to calculate the field in the near zone, we have to complete it with the integral over the past, over the far zone. And at high enough order in these, uh, in these sequences, you do get contributions from the far zone integral. You can't ignore them. At lowest order, they tend to be uh, zero, but at high enough order, such contributions start to kick in and you have to have them. Uh, they can be very important. I'm sorry? Is there a problem with the instantaneous potential? Uh, no, because we started with a, this, this, this is perfectly causal, right? And we've just approximated it by this expansion. If, if this infinite sequence, if this infinite series converges, then this is exactly equal to that. Right? So we've just approximated the retardation with this particular expansion. And, and at any level of truncation, you are taking retardation into account. It's not perfectly instantaneous, but you're making an error. But again, depends on how accurate you want to be. Maybe you can ignore that error. Okay, let me illustrate uh, it's sort of in a little more detail what might come out of such a near zone expansion. And here we'll just focus on the inner integral uh, to, um, to get our answer. And now well, let's go back to the full uh, field, H alpha beta, not just this little truncated mu. And let's just look at the zero, zero component. Because as you know, it's H zero, zero that's gonna look like the Newtonian potential, right? G zero, zero. We know, say, for a, a Newtonian limit, looks like that. So this thing is going to sort of give us the Newtonian limit at the very lowest order. So H00 then is this integral of tau 0, 0 times these powers of x minus x prime with various time derivatives. 
And here's the whole sequence. For the zero, L equals zero, we get tau zero zero over x minus x prime times four g over c to the fourth. Well, that looks like the Newtonian potential. At lowest order, remember tau zero zero is rho, the density. So this is just Newton, rho over x minus x prime. But of course, tau contains lots of higher order corrections, including h itself. So there'll be higher order corrections built in here that you have to include when you calculate h zero zero. Now the next term, notice, has two time derivatives. What happened to the, the term that involved one time derivative? Remember there was a sequence, L equals zero to infinity, zero, one, zero time derivatives, and then one time, two, three, four, five, but we've skipped the one time derivative and got two. What happened to the, first, the, the next term with one d by dt? What, is that, what did that term look like? That first term looked like minus 1 over c times d by dt of tau 0, 0. And then there was an x minus x prime to the l minus 1, but l is 1, so there's no x minus x prime. It's tau 0, 0 d3x. So what, what's the answer to that, d by dt of that? 0 or 1, right? Not 16 pi over. So what's the answer? Okay, why is it zero? Because this is the total energy, right? And at least to high order, until you worry about gravitational wave emission, to some high degree of accuracy, this is a constant, and so d by dt is zero. You can actually worry about the higher order terms, but they'll be of very high powers of one over c. Uh, you could worry about those if you wish. But at least to the lowest orders, this is a constant, so d by dt vanishes. So you skip that first term simply because mass energy is conserved. So the next term is two time derivatives and one over c squared. And now you have tau zero zero and you have x minus x prime to the two minus one. So you have x minus x prime in the numerator. Oop, there, no half pn term that because of the conservation of mass. Okay, and here, is where you encounter this famous superpotential that you looked at in the, in the um, tutorial yesterday. It's not very useful, or it doesn't really appear in Newtonian theory, but it appears in general relativity, and this is a really a direct reflection of the retardation of the gravity. It's this t minus x minus x prime that generates this term. It's one over c squared effect, two time derivatives, so it's gonna be smaller. There'll be like a v over c squared effect here compared to that. So, but you get this super potential uh, contribution. So it's a first post-Newtonian order, v over c squared, and you have two time derivatives of this super potential. But again, remember, tau itself has lots of in stuff in there. It's not just rho, it's rho plus its own corrections. So there's lots of higher order corrections that are implicit here. Here's a term that you can actually throw away. If you think about it. It's three time derivatives times tau zero zero times x minus x prime squared. Well, let's look at this term by term. Let's actually work out this square. So it's gonna be x squared minus two x dot x prime plus x prime squared. So the first term has x squared. Well, that's not x prime, so it can be pulled outside the integral. And we have three time derivatives of the integral of tau zero zero d three x prime. Well, what's that? Zero, right? It's two time derivatives of the, of the mass, so it's zero. It Modulus some higher order corrections. Then we have the cross term. We have x dot x prime. Well, again, we can bring the x outside so we have t tau zero zero times x prime d three x. What's that? Sorry, zero. zero, because this is defines the center of mass tau zero zero times x prime. So that's the center of mass of the system, and it may move. 
but you're hitting it with three time derivatives. And if it moves, it moves uniformly. So all those time derivatives are going to kill that. Right? So no term there. The final term is tau zero zero x prime squared integrated over d3x. That's not zero. That's going to be some, looks like a, like a quadruple moment or something, a moment of inertia of the system. Tau zero zero times r prime squared d3x. It's non-zero. However, it's purely a function of time, right? We've integrated over all x prime. So this is a pure function of time. Hit it with three time derivatives is still a pure function of time. And it turns out if you have such a term, you can always get rid of it by doing a coordinate transformation. Remember, this is the zero, zero component of the metric. Once you've got the metric, you can change coordinates. And you can, it turns out you can just change your coordinate system in order to uh, kill this term. So it's a pure gauge or coordinate effect. A slightly different way of saying it is that when it comes time to calculating, say, the equations of motion, the first thing you're going to do is take a gradient of h0,0, right? Just like grad u. So if you take a gradient of this thing, which is purely a function of time, you'll also get zero. So two different, two different ways to see that this term, at least at the lowest order, uh, doesn't contribute. Turns out there's some higher order effects that you do have to worry about, but uh, at this level, we, we can drop it. Okay, then there's this term, which has uh, this x minus x prime cubed and four time derivatives, so it's a second post-Newtonian term. It's v over c to the fourth. Each time you get v over c squared, you're at a higher post-Newtonian order. So this is two pn. And this is called, uh, this was called the superpotential, and uh, after a great deal of uh, concentration, trying to figure out the best name for this, uh, it's a highly technical name, this is the superduper potential. Okay, and then going one more step, we get this term, five time derivatives of tau zero zero. And this is a two and a half post-Newtonian term. It's V over C to the fifth, so it's 2.5 PN. And this is where you begin to get the effects of gravitational radiation reaction. Um, Let me just see if I have time to. Yeah. Uh, and just to give an idea of what this might look like, let's do the same thing we did here and crank out some of the results and, and, uh, and see what they look like. So. We have five time derivatives in our H0,0. Zero zero. Of this integral of tau zero, 0, and let's expand x minus x prime to the fourth. So it's, you know, it's x squared minus two x x dot x prime plus x prime squared, all squared. So there'll be a term that looks like uh, x to the fourth. And I'm not going to work this out with every term. I'm just going to generically write what the various terms look like. There'll be a term that looks like um, three x's and one x prime. Then there'll be a term that looks like two x's and two x primes. Several terms. I mean, again, it's just, it's just schematic. Then there'll be a term that looks like x and x prime cubed, and then a term that looks like x prime to the fourth. Okay? So what do we get from this term? Zero, right? X comes outside the integral, and it's just time derivatives of the mass. What about this term? Zero, again, this comes outside, and these are high time derivatives of the center of mass. 
What about this term? We're on a roll here. We got two zeros. What's this going to be? This is going to be essentially zero, just the same as that term here was. It's You'll end up with a pure function of time, which you could transform away, or equivalently, you get something that's a pure function of time, and the first thing you do with the H is take a gradient to get the, say, the equations of motion. So again, this term uh, gives zero. This term also gives zero, but for a slightly more subtle reason, you, you can bring the x outside, but ta zero zero times x cubed integrated, there's nothing special about it. You can't, it's not obviously zero. The time derivatives don't kill it, it's, it's non-zero. But you get a term that's linear in x, and it turns out this can also be killed by a, a coordinate transformation. It would be a transformation that depends on x. Another, or another way of saying it is when you take your gradient, you get a, a term in the acceleration that's a pure function of time, and that can be absorbed into other stuff. Okay? There's a bit of an argument that you have to go through to, uh, to show that that term uh, is, not, uh, is dead, but you can do it. But this is a term, the remainder, there are actually uh, two terms that contribute, uh, is definitely non-zero. It's a potential that's quadratic in h squared. So when you take a gradient of it, you get, you get a force that's linear in x. And it depends on the quadrupole moment of the source. So this h0,0 looks like five time derivatives of the quadrupole moment of the source. This has two indices, so it's like i, j, k. So tau 0, 0 times this with two indices looks like uh, some kind of a quadrupole moment of the source, times two x's, x, j, k. And this, as we'll see much later, we'll, do, we'll fill in all the details here later on, this represents the effects of gravitational radiation reaction. It's the loss of gravitational waves that are controlled by the quadrupole moment of the source, that emission of gravitational waves produces a force back in the near zone that affects the uh, motion of the source itself via this potential. So when you take a gradient of h to get the force, the acceleration, uh, then you get something linear in x with this time-dependent uh, function that is going to um, make the source evolve. And the important thing about this is that it is odd in time. So if you change the direction of time, if you let t go to minus t, this changes sign. And that's an indication that this is a dissipative effect, right? One source of time, it evolves this way, turn time backwards, and it evolves in the other direction. All these other terms are even in time, so when you change the direction of time, it doesn't change the, the direction of the dynamics. So this really tells you that this is a dissipative effect. But that's what you expect. The source is emitting gravitational waves in losing some energy, so it had better lose energy in an equal amount. Okay. So uh, just schematically speaking, then, this is where the first uh, contribution of radiation reaction will occur from this 2.5 pn term. Okay. Any questions? So. Right. So it's a bit. So, for example, I said you could have you could find a coordinate transformation of the metric once you've got the full metric. Make a coordinate transformation. Make that zero. Turns out you can only make it zero to this. Uh, 1.5 pn order. It, that coordinate transformation actually generates some terms at a higher order, actually a 2.5 pn order, that, that are non-zero. So, um, so these coordinate transformations are just themselves you know, approximate, right? You make an infinitesimal one. Um, and so only this leading term can, you can really kill by a coordinate transformation. 
but at higher order, you get additional terms. So, so it's not an exact, uh, an exact expression. Another way of saying it is that this, this is a function of time, so when you take a gradient of h, it goes away. But there are actually terms in the equations of motion that involve time derivatives of h. And so that, that would contribute, but those are higher order. Sorry? What do you mean by higher order? Higher order in, these, in this post-Newtonian sense. Remember, so this is of order v over c cubed. So um, the, the higher order terms, because it involves h dot and there's another v in there, the equations of motion don't just involve the gradient of h, there's other stuff from the divergence of t alpha beta vanishing. Those terms might produce uh, things at 2.5 pn order or 3 pn order and so on. Remember, every time you have a time derivative, you get a v over c. So that raises the order somewhat. Um, so again, this is sort of just a schematic way of trying to see what the lowest order terms in the metric in H might look like in the near zone. Newtonian, a 1 pn term, a 2 pn term. And the first place you have something that's non-trivial is at, at 2.5 pn. There's nothing at, of course, nothing at 0.5, that we know, nothing at 1.5 pn, but uh, establishing that can also generate stuff that will show up at 2.5 pn order. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So what if we do something else? Well, I mean, you could, but I'm not sure why you, why you would. I mean, remember, we're looking, we, we want to, well, it might depend on the physical problem, but we want to deal with physical problems where we know the field is weak. And so we, we really want to start with h equals 0 as our lowest order approximation. Flat space time is the zeroth order approximation to our metric, and then we want to build higher and higher order corrections. I mean, you might say, let's pick H0 to be Schwarzschild or something. I'm not sure how you would do that or what, how meaningful that would be, but it might be something to, to contemplate. But it would be for a different kind of problem. Uh, but maybe you could do it. But one thing I, w I would say, I guarantee if you did that, it would get very messy very fast. Not that this, I mean, you may think this is messy, but you know, you don't know what messy is until you try something like that. I'm sorry? Memory, Memory terms? So um, not from here. So this is the leading order terms in, in radiation reaction. In this language, the memory occurs at um, fifth post-Newtonian order. Is that right? It's 2.5 beyond quadruple. Because 1.5 are tail terms. And, and, and 2.5 are memory. So the, the contributions of memory to this near zone integral uh, occur at, at v over c to the 10th. They're much more important, so they're very small from the point of view of the, the internal dynamics, but they are interesting in the far zone. And in fact, it's really, one example of this is that. So for the field in the far zone, the, uh, so there are really two effects that are important in, the, in, in, in these kind of, that are generated by the nonlinearities of gravity. One are called tail terms, and that's the fact that as, say, the, the field propagates outwards, it scatters off the static background that the source itself has created. Okay? So those are tail terms, and of course you have to integrate over all the infinite paths to calculate them, but they can be calculated, and they were detected in the signal that LIGO detected from the in-spiraling binary, and, and the, the little, that little term in the, in the formula agreed with the general relativity. So this is something that's actually been detected. The memory, uh, what's called the Christodula memory, is a slightly different. It's the fact that 
as the system radiates gravitational waves, those waves don't scatter off the background. That's the tail. But those waves emit their own gravitational radiation. You know, mass energy is a source of gravity, and varying mass energy emits gravitational waves. So the gravitational waves that are emitted by the source emit their own gravitational waves. And that's what the Christodoulou memory is. The waves are propagating outward, and they are emitting their own gravitational waves, and some little bit of that reaches us here and now. That's a much smaller effect. It's a V over C squared smaller than the, uh, no, yeah, one point. Yeah, V over C squared smaller than the tail effect. Um, and it's not detectable, it hasn't been detected so far in LIGO. It's very difficult to detect. People talk about detecting the memory in gravitational waves all the time. So it's something that there's a lot of activity going on. There's some formal questions about memory that uh, the people are thinking about. Um, but because it's so small, it's very difficult to really detect. But there's, there may be a chance uh, if the right source comes along with the right signal to noise. The stronger the source, the better your chance of detecting these very tiny effects. Well, there, now in that case, so, so that's a, a different use of the term memory, and I wish people would find some terminology that distinguished these different things. But um, even in the simplest cases where you're forgetting all these higher order terms and just looking at the lowest order signal, the quadrupole formula, okay? If you, for, and this is just a very simple example, if you have a very, the simplest case of a, a body, massive body, and a small body passes by it on a scattering orbit. This is called gravitational bremsstrahlung. The signal you get, it depends on direction. It's, 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 it's not like waves, it's just like a single bump because there's just one passage. But in some directions, you get a signal that looks like this. But in other directions, you get a signal that looks like this. So that there's actually a permanent displacement. If you, if you had LIGO mirrors, they would start like this and they would go like that. And there'd be a d definite displacement between the two. For example, the body on a hyperbolic. Hmm? For example, the body on a hyperbolic. That's right. That's right. And then things like, so this is some, a different kind of memory. It's, the, it's a, just a lowest order memory that occurs in electrodynamics, too. This is just a signal because you're going from one state to another the signal can have a different kind of ground state in some sense. Um, but it's not the same in all directions. Depending on the direction, uh, you can get different ones. Uh, many, many years ago, Mike Turner and I worked out all the details of this gravitational bremsstrahl. And, and uh, in this paper, we have a whole bunch of graphs of what the signal looks like in, in a whole bunch of directions. Some have this memory effect, some don't. Uh, but again, this is very difficult to detect because in a, in a, in a sense, Unless you can really detect this part of it where it changes, but then it's, of course, a very small correction to the big signal, you might say, well, why can't I detect this displacement? But this displacement is a zero frequency effect. And for something like LIGO, zero frequency you can't detect. I mean, there's the seismic wall at 10 hertz. You can't see zero frequency phenomena because the noise gets too large. So this is the challenge of trying to say anything about memory with real detectors. Doesn't mean to say it's impossible, but it means probably that you really need to catch the signal in this region where it's changing and separate out the memory, the tail effects, the, all the basic PN terms, uh, and try to catch uh, the bit that it corresponds to this memory. I mean, this was actually, I mean, there's a whole political story related to this. That when, and again, the Christodoula memory has a similar effect. Uh, for uh, basically, you also get a memory effect. Uh, for example, if you have uh, any null radiation from a source, you get a memory effect. Because you sit here with a detector, and here's a source, you have null radiation coming out, and you're detecting the effects of that radiation. After it passes, your, your detector can have a, dis a displacement. And this is known from neutrino fluxes, electromagnetic fluxes. So anything where, where the null field, you have a null field that carries energy itself, 
you can have this memory effect. Um, I mean, one simple explanation is, you know, you start off with a system of mass m, and your detector now sees a system of mass m minus delta m, corresponding to the energy radiated, and so there's a net change in your, in your detector if you could detect that change. Um, but when Christodoulou found this, this particular kind of memory effect where gravitational waves generate their own waves, then as those gravitational waves pass your detector, then there is a net change in the mirror separation like that. And this is in the early 1990s when LIGO was being considered for funding by the US uh, government. And a number of astronomers, notably Jerry Ostreicher and others who uh, were opposed to LIGO, uh, latched onto this Christodoulou memory saying, you know, why do we need this fancy LIGO with all this size? Why don't we just set up some mirrors and measure the change it, it, the net change, which is much easier to measure than these very tiny oscillations, just measure the net change, be much cheaper and you don't need a big LIGO. This was in the newspapers and it, it was all part of the debate over whether LIGO should be funded, um, despite the fact that many people presented arguments that said you really can't measure this in such a simple way. Uh, some of these astronomers made a big noise about it and uh, it had an impact on, you know, we, we, People who were supported LIGO had to really argue, convince the politicians why this argument wasn't right, and it was being made by some very prominent astronomers. The, fault, the defects in this argument and that LIGO really should be funded. Of course, as we know, it, ultimately they succeeded. But for a time, and I remember the time because I was called at one point to testify before a, a, one of the science subcommittees of the, of the House of Representatives, and it was a very critical time for LIGO funding, and uh, I testified, of course, in favor of LIGO, but a very famous astronomer testified against. He said LIGO shouldn't be funded, it's too difficult, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, uh, but ultimately LIGO won the day. So, but, so this memory has played a, an interesting political role in the whole story. But it is really a very difficult thing to measure. But there's, there's a lot of literature on it these days, and there's a lot of sort of very interesting formal literature on what memory really means in various contexts, not just gravity, but also in electrodynamics, what, you know, what's the implication of memory? Uh, so it's kind of a net change of state of your system because waves have passed you by. So it's an interesting topic. It's flashing. Okay, any, one, any question? I'm sorry? This one? Oh, because uh, X can be up brought outside the integral. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. And then what is the interpretation of this one going to be Well, I mean, there's, there's no interpretation. It's just that, you know, the, you know the source has certain global properties. Energy is conserved up to the point where gravitational waves are emitted. Uh, and center of mass is, moves uniformly and up to the point where you're, you're emitting gravitational momentum and so on. So to the order of approximation where we're working, you know, the source has certain behaviors that automatically kill terms in this particular expansion. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's not exact because we know five time deri derivatives of this for this first term are not exactly zero because rate gravity you know, radiation is being emitted. But that failure to be zero is already a, a higher order effect that takes you way beyond, uh, you know, fifth or sixth post-Newtonian order. So again, so you have to discuss all of this in the context of building higher and higher corrections to your, to your uh, model, and that certain terms you can throw away, but recognizing that one day they might contribute if you go to high enough order. You, you, you have to be careful when you're going to high orders to, to not to throw away things that you really should be keeping. But for this discussion, at lowest order, all these terms uh, can be seen to vanish uh, to that order. Okay.